can hear Romy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Accounting Design Project. I'm Hiromi Wakabayashi from Kone University in Japan. Ayun and Steven, thank you very much for giving me a great opportunity to be a, a, a moderator for this excellent event. Today, we are delighted to have Jeremiah uh, Green from Texas A&M University, and who is going to present a paper on measuring expected volatility using earnings line items as risk exposure. Before the presentation, I would like to uh, remind everyone of some housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, in order to encourage active participation, it would be helpful if you could turn on your camera and unless you ask a question, uh, please hold the presenter uninterrupted. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the raise your hands function or type your questions in the chat box. I will follow uh, in order. Uh, okay, uh, that's all. Uh, uh, now, Jeremiah, uh, the screen is yours. All right, well, thank you all of you for uh, taking the time to you know, discuss the paper. I think this has been a great series over the past couple of years that um, have been some great discussions and great papers. So, you know, hopefully you'll get something out of what we do here. Um, I guess just a little housekeeping thing on my side. So if I turn this way and I'm not looking at you, well, I'm looking at your picture, your videos. Sorry, I'd like it'll look like I'm not looking at you, but I'm looking at your video here. Here I'm looking at my presentation. So well, anyway, so don't feel like, oh, he's not even paying attention. So um, so this is a paper with Wanja, and Wanja is a um, PhD student that's on the market this year. And I think as you'll see, and we go through, um, you know, she's been instrumental in making this paper sort of succeed. And um, it started with her second year summer paper. And we've been, that means we've been working on it for a little bit. And we still maybe don't have it all right, but I think we're getting closer. This is a brand new version. We'll see if um, you know I sort of get the motivation right and, and it makes sense to you. But um, anyway, Wanj is off to a great start, and and you'll see you know a lot of her work in, in here. Um, all right. So the the goal we're trying to work on here in this paper is thinking big picture about how the income statement can tell us about risk. And, and specifically the thing we are working on is how the income statement tells us about um, a firm's exposures to systematic risk. So this will bring to mind a whole lot of papers that you know, you'll think about. And so we're one of many of these types of papers and hopefully I can show you the, the innovations that we have uh, in what we're doing. Um, before we get started here too much, so the next um, one of these is on October 4th, 11 a.m., same time. Um, Sadipta will be doing this. He's been around in a lot of these um, over the past couple of years as well. So, um, you know, we hope you show up to that. Um, then another piece, if, um, you know, we're talking about accounting design and for a little while as I'm going through this stuff, it may seem like um, maybe we don't have a lot to say about accounting design, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why we, I think this matters. And the big picture, like I said, is talking about how accounting in information and particularly income statement line items um, tell us about systematic risk exposure. So this is sort of on the what does the information tell us um, from accounting, what do we learn from it, but when we get into the implementation of how we go ahead and measure this. I think this is where it is really related to accounting design. And that is um, one of the things that really matters when we're trying to measure risk from the income statement is um, that would be fantastic would be if income statement line items were separated by their risk level. So high risk thing, things with high risk or high return or expected returns um, separated from those with low risk and low expected returns, that provides more information to um, investors. 
And we have a little bit of that already. I think if, if you think about separating operating versus finance, financing activities, so there's a little of that already that could be helpful. Um, or we have some reports that will, uh, you know, 10Ks, for example, that will split into different product lines. Those sorts of things I think are really helpful when we go thinking about measuring uh, systematic risk from accounting income numbers. Um, and so as we get into that, I'll show you where that becomes really important in terms of thinking about um, the systematic risk information in uh, income statements. All right, so the let me give some motivation and then some of the basics of what we're doing in the paper and then feel free to jump in whenever you want. So there are some papers that look at uh, using cross-sectional data to look at earnings, the uncertainty of future earnings, or um, expected volatility of future earnings. And these are all based on cross-sectional models of data. So um, using specific models or using some uh, sort of tricks in cross-sectional regression. So um, like this Constantinidi paper uses quantile regressions to say um, firms that have, a, uh, when we're in different quantiles of that regression, they have different predictions for their earnings, and then they have a sort of trick to come up with the cross-section of expected sort of volatility in earnings. So there's a bunch of papers that do this. The part that sort of motivated our paper is that, um, especially this Chang paper, and then Donaldson and Resetech also sort of do this. They find that uncertainty, higher uncertainty, is associated with lower future returns. Well, this should make you think a little bit about um, papers in stock returns and volatility, and it's sort of the volatility puzzle where high volatility is associated with lower future returns, and then there are a bunch of papers trying to address that. Well, we're sort of doing the same thing, and maybe it doesn't sound like a big sort of thing we're trying to address, but what we're trying to do is say, can we develop a way to measure the expected volatility of earnings from cross-sectional data to capture systematic risk. And then if we can get that systematic risk that is driving uncertainty, um, if that is associated with non-diversifiable risk, then we should see a positive association with returns. So investors should price it as if they it is something um, costly that they that they want to press, okay? All right, we got a couple of things going. So it's so the controllable versus uncontrollable risk above the line. So we're talking about the entire income statement. So, um, and primarily above the line items. So we'll, I'll, we'll get to that, like how we're trying to measure it. Controllable versus uncontrollable. Well, we're trying to talk about systematic um, risk from an investor standpoint. Um, controllable versus uncontrollable. Do you want to expand it? Like the firm can make a decision that will then make them more or less risky? Is that what so, you mean by uh, Sort of uh, compensation perspective or, you know, from the manager perspective, there's always been this debate about the income statement. Should it be all inclusive or just sort of persistent components, right? So that's why we have extraordinary items and all of that stuff below the line. Yeah. And part of the logic is that managers can control the operations, but they can't control earthquakes, mm. right? Yeah. And so, um, so there's this uh, long-standing debate going back 50 years about should we define, how should we define earnings? And we use the same kind of logic, say in financial statement analysis and valuation, sometimes we toss the stuff below the line or we smooth them over years or whatever, because uh, we don't feel they're as relevant. As yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's helpful. I, thanks for explaining that. So yeah, so we're thinking about um, normal operating activities that we would put above the line that could be persistent items. Um, those are the things we're thinking about. That's different from, you know, some, there are some other papers that are looking at um, below the line items and whether that um, informs about risk, but no, we're thinking about things that the manager um, takes an active role in, makes decisions about their operations, their sales activities, things like that, 
um, that inform about um, the risk exposures that they face. So yeah, above the lines, that is what we're talking about. Okay, and then just a follow-up question because uh, sort of, you know, this is my area in part. Um, <laughs> you talked about, uh, you're taking a two-tailed definition of risk, which is sort of statistical risk, but firms and investors care a lot about hazard risk, which is the bottom tail, not the top tail. Sure. And so you could think of conservatism and conservative reporting as reflecting that kind of risk. And so the question then is, why is two-tail risk more relevant than one-tail risk when we know that accountants are conservative and not choosing two-tail risk to report? Sure, yeah, that's a great Could question. Could you measure we like that? And to the conceptual work? No, great, great question. Um, we, our method does not, cannot deal with um, one tail, like we're concerned about a certain direction, right? We, we can't do that. Um, conceptually, I agree with you, right? They might care more about like downside risk, for example, but we can't pick that up. And part of it has been the struggle that you will see that we've had of when you think about cross-sectional data, how do you measure something like systematic risk in a cross section, and that that it's taken us quite a while to figure this out. And so, given what we've been able to figure out, we can only deal with variance, right? That there's no sort of other thing we can do at this point. Although I totally agree with you conceptually that there would be other parts there that we would be concerned about. So, yeah. So, agree with you. Don't know if that means that we're good. Variance, but yeah, I agree with you. But I just want yeah. to make sure. We understand what risk you're not considering in your analysis. That's all. Yep, that's right. Yep, we're we're not doing that at this point. So yeah. Okay, so let me give you an overview of sort of what the paper looks like, and especially because when you get when we get into the how we're measuring things, uh, I can get a little. Um, we can get bogged down in certain pieces of it a little bit. So. Um, the main part that we're starting with, and this is both conceptual and sort of empirically, um, we need this, is we're starting with the idea that income statement line items are the risk sensitivity. So like when you see revenue, that in tells you about their beta is what we might think about in other cases. That is their systematic exposure to some factors that we're not specifying. We're going to estimate them, but if you have higher revenue, that's higher or lower risk. If you have higher cost of goods sold, that's higher or lower risk. So that's our starting point that allows us to think about um, risk in the cross section. Um, and then from that, now if we assert that um, income statement light items are betas or systematic risk exposure, then we can estimate the risk factors. So then these will be sort of like, um, you know, the market factor or, or book to market factor, things like that or parallels to that, but focusing on only the line items from the income statement. Sir Meyer, yeah. uh, 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 Basu has a question. Yeah. So are you assuming that these line items are measured independently or are you taking matching into consideration in your analysis? Independently, you meaning with across firms? No, within or, firms, but different line items. You mean that the, the individual line items are independent? Yeah, um, or sort yeah. of, you know, forced together, say, by matching, of course, to goods sold to revenue. Yeah, so, they, so we, we're allowing for it them to be correlated and not independent. Although, back to the accounting design project issue, if we really wanted to get the best possible estimates, it would be fantastic if they were independent and we could measure um, the risk to individual pieces, right? But they're, we acknowledge that they are correlated, right? They're the same, dri driven by some of the same things. And so, no, we, we're not assuming that they're independent. And we try, this is one of the challenges in, in, in going through the estimation approach is, what happens when they're correlated? How, what do we do with that? So yeah, we're not, we're not assuming that. So, okay, so we go through these two things, right? So now if you think this is the case, we have income statement items, we have risk factors related to those items. Once we have those two, then it 
becomes just a math game to calculate the variance that comes from um, systematic risk or the expected variance coming from systematic risk. So then let me highlight the results that, that we find and then we can get into actually more details about how we're doing this and what it means. So we do all this fancy stuff. We measure, we call it sigma, which is the standard deviation of expected earnings. And it's highly correlated with other things you would expect, earnings volatility with betas. And it has, and it's incrementally informative about future returns, you know, relative to other factors. So it has an annualized alpha, meaning unexplained by other risk factors of depending on equal or evaluated 6% or 12%, which we think is about you know, reasonable if we're thinking about a return to, to risk. Um, and then in terms of why would we use this measure and not another measure? So sigma is associated with returns when you don't have analyst forecasts. So um, there are some papers that use analyst forecasts for expected returns, thinking about earnings beta, for example. This works when that doesn't exist. There, it also works when you have no time series. So if you have a time series where you want to estimate earnings beta, well, ours will work in the cross section without having a time series. Um, yeah, sure. Steve. So, so not that it needs to be in this analysis, but um, conceptually, is there a reason you couldn't do this with balance sheet items as well? And would you think that maybe that has sort of like incremental expense power? I'm sort of thinking. You could have a lot of fixed assets in a certain kind of manufacturing, say, real estate and plant and equipment, and potentially that's the source of volatility to firm value. Sure. Yeah. So I conceptually, I, I agree that there could be real and important information in the balance sheet about risk, right? And, and that's sort of related to how we think about um, where risk exposure lies, I guess. Um, I'll show you in our setup, it sort of leads us to focus on in the income statement. Although there's no other than our sort of motivation and approach, there's no reason not to think about the balance sheet. So I, let me jump to that for just a second. So um, this is our setup here and it sort of follows other papers that um, do accounting valuation, right? So if we have here, um, book values generate net income and how they generate net income is through these expected returns to those book values. So this is a typical accounting valuation model right, where book values generate net income. Well, if, these, if the income is generated by the expected returns to book value, that's, these are the risk factors, then we have an implementation problem where um, we have fixed effects of you know, persistent things about companies that if we try and estimate it in a cross section, we can't estimate it. And, or we can't separate out what's like some persistent thing about a firm rather than um, you know, the risk related information. So if, if we take the first difference, this is, you know, people have been doing this for a long time. If you take the first difference of this equation, then what it says is, when we estimate this, we've got rid of the firm persistent information and we can estimate changes in net income on net income. And in this case, net income drives changes in net income through these risk factors. So this setup, um, because we're trying to implement this idea, tells us we should use net income here if we're using, if, we're, if this is our sort of driving approach. Although this, this is just a conceptual sort of setup. Why, what should we focus on? Well, the income statement, but empirically there's no reason, right? Book value is in here. We're motivating it by book value, actually. Um, there's no reason we shouldn't be thinking about that sort of stuff, but really we're thinking about sort of changes in book value when we're doing this estimation. And so that's how we ended up looking at the income statement items. But um, anyway, that's why we're focusing on the income statement. Sure, uh, yep. Sudipta, so I have a question. Yeah, Sudipta. So, so on the second equation, why isn't it comprehensive income rather than net income? Why are you assuming clean surplus when you know it's false? Yeah. Um, can I just give you a lame answer? Like uh, we wanted to start with the easy things, and 
So yes, it's to, it should be comprehensive income there, right? If we if we want to be match this equation to this equation, for sure, that should be the case. Um, and then related to your comment there too, right? If we think about what is going to provide information, if, if we don't think about this setup particularly, and we just think about what information in financial statements should apply, should tell us information about risk. Well, yeah, cash flow items, accrual items, the balance sheet items, these are all things that probably matter. Um, but we, what we didn't want to do is go down a path of let's just try everything and see what happens. Um, so we sort of wanted to start with something we could direct our approach with. And then, of course, moving on to other stuff would be valuable, but we haven't done anything beyond that. So, yeah, um, I guess Ayun, is that who's next? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think I have a similar question to Steve earlier is that um, what does this gamma mean conceptually in the second equation? So like I think the first equation is something we are kind of familiar with is mm -hmm. that depending on the asset composition, right? The example mm -hmm. you gave in the oil and gas company versus an R&D firm or manufacturing yep. firm, different asset composition will yield different uh, distributions of a future cash flow. Right. Uh, yep. But empirically, it's challenging to estimate that. Uh, so we move on to the second equation. But conceptually, what does that gamma in the second equation really capture is something I struggle with when yeah, I write okay. the paper. Yeah. Is Let that also try... cost of capital or? or yes, cost of gamma? capital is the idea. So let me... Okay. let me try and see if that answers your question. But uh, let me try a couple of things and see if it sort of answers it, right? So first, right, in this first equation, this is a, a type of cost of capital, right? And the reason it is the sum of these is because we could think about breaking book value into every part that has a different cost of capital. So we could have debt versus equity, um, ass, or equity versus, sorry, assets versus liabilities. We could have other things in here that vary based on their cost of capital. And so, Anything that is separate by, at you know by the balance sheet, should have its own sort of associated required required return. And then in the models that we use, we we just aggregate them together. So okay, so this is a required return measure, right? Cost of capital of some sort. Well, just the empirical side. If we take the first differences, that is the exact same gamma. So. The cost of capital here should be cost of capital here. Although that's just because we're taking first differences, the, the coefficient should be exactly the same. But the prop the conceptually it's a little harder to think about. And so let me try this conceptual thing. Let's see, where did I put it here? So um, if we think about the income statement items telling you about being exposed to systematic risk. So let's go back here again. So if if we're thinking about this as a systematic risk equation, gammas are the cost of capital or the, the risk factor. Book values are the beta. That, that's the equivalent to like an asset pricing um, model. So if we go here, we can think about that. Well, if how can, for example, higher or lower sales, or here I'm using the example of sales on account, how can that tell us about risk exposure, well, these are some examples. So if, you if you're a company that has really high sales all on account, I guess this would go back to Siddhartha's accrual issue. So if you have high accruals on account, that means when the, the job market changes, right, the aggregate sort of economy and, and people can't pay their accounts, then you're now more exposed to that those fluctuations because of your um, your the sales that you've generated right that are based on their having to pay that on account. Or similarly, if you have if you're a company that has high income tax expense and tax law changes happen, you're more exposed to those changes than someone that has a small amount. Or you know it, we can go through these sorts of examples, trying to think about. How is it that those line items reflect those um, risk exposures? And then, then, then we can think about these as sort of betas, right? 
or net income as betas here, and then the gammas as some sort of cost of capital measure. And in, the, in those examples, this would be like uh, the cost to, uh, or, or the, how much in aggregate people can pay their accounts, uh, accounts payable, for example. That sort of help, and maybe I didn't quite get to what that is, but. Can I have like two follow up? Yeah, I think yeah. when, when I read the title and in the beginning, I thought you are running a more like earnings beta exercise, but instead of regressing firm level earnings uh, on the aggregate earnings, you kind of mm -hmm. split it into firm level. So like my first question is that why not going through that route will more directly estimate the aggregate risk for particular line item? Uh, Yep. Okay. So a couple reasons for that. So um, one is if you're trying to deal with a cross section of data, you, you can't estimate that, right? Like you say, well, I've got aggregate ROA, for example, that doesn't tell you anything about the cross section of one firm is different from another. So there's no link there, right? Um, the time series, right? If that yeah, would exactly. kind of force you to do the time series. Yeah, exactly. And then the other aspect is if you have lots of risk factors and you go to the time series, you, you know, you get like one shot or two shots at it, right? Like the there isn't much you can do, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really a practical issue of why we went to this cross-section stuff. And in the appendix, we talk about how like here, this, well, especially here, this um, gamma here can be thought of pretty, have a close parallel to aggregate ROE. So if you have net income on book value, that's an aggregate factor, right? So we're trying to show that there is a, there's a close parallel to what we think about as aggregate accounting risk factors. Um, but because we're dealing with the cross section, we have to sort of think carefully about how to do that. And this is sort of related to Penguo's question here. So gamma here is, notice it says T, this is each, peri each period we have a new gamma, okay? so um 2000 in one cross section you have two year 2000 estimated that's a gamma which is like um let's say aggregate roa 2001 do it again you have a new gamma so then we have a time series of gammas those time series of gammas can then be applied to a single cross section it's sort of how we're doing this and maybe it's easier if i just show you the empirical part about what we do. So th this is our model, okay? So let me build through how this model works. So, um, you know, we, we come from this here to this is the model. So we just break up um, income into the major pieces, right? Now, comprehensive income, dividend, you know, other things need to go in there to be actual change in book values. But we took income and just, broke it up into all the pieces, large pieces that we know about. Then we estimate each period this regression. So um, gamma one, we estimate like 2001 to 2000, you know, every year, for example, gamma two every year, gamma three every year. And we are assuming then that we are asserting that this gamma is a risk factor that we can then use to apply to the beta, which is the revenue here. Hopefully that sort of makes some sense here. So estimate this every period, take these risk factors. We're going to combine these risk factors with the line items to then come up with our measure. And there's a parallel here that I think is worth thinking about is that um, Fama and French, um, I can't remember which year, 2019, maybe, maybe 2020, what they do is they compare whether um, their standard factors that they that they have done in the past of just um, you know sorting firms and then coming up with a, a risk factor that they put out there. Um, they uh, the alternative that they do is to regress returns on a bunch of firm characteristics, and this it's the same as this right. This would be returns. They put in other things here, but of course theirs is motivated differently. So they put in book to market, um, you know, asset growth, other things in here. And then they show that their risk factors, so their gammas, um, they show that that actually works better 
than doing the standard risk factors that they used to do. So in other words, we're just doing what they did, but with accounting information to say, these things are risk factors. So that's that's the only innovation we're using. So yes, I see lots of uh, comments here, but yeah. Should I start with, let's see, lots of reasons these relationships could be nonlinear, cost stickiness, conservatism, leverage. Sure, totally agree with you. Um, are, is your comment about that, about maybe we're not getting what we think we're getting, or is it about this is not specified, the, you know, it should be specified differently? It's, um, you're not sort of modeling the relationship correctly. So then the question is, what does that misspecification do to your measures and, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so in recessions, you're going to get a lot more write-offs than in non-recession yeah. period. Uh, if you have a model that doesn't allow things to be nonlinear, then you're going to get very different measures, but the recession year measure is going to be a lot more noisy than the non-recession year. The non-recession sure. year is more likely to be, say, closer to linearity than non-linear. So now you're going to have these different gammas, but it's coming from the misspecification, and you're calling that misspecification your measure of beta. Sure, that I mean that could be the case, right? One of the hard parts is we don't know what form this model should take, right? That and so yeah. I mean, the only thing I can justify it with is we're trying to stick as closely to this idea as possible. Um, you know, this is conceptual, right? Empirically, this may not even be the right thing. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. And we haven't done anything to try and say what other, are, do we have this wrong, right? And does it affect our, um, I mean, I, I guess it's hard to think about I don't know what it would do in terms of does it um, spuriously create some associations or does it hurt our associations? I'm not sure, right? I don't know which direction that would go. But yeah, I, I agree. That should be something to you know to think about how to do that. Um, what if a firm has a business portfolio that risk from individual premises offset? Right? So can you help me? I, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I think my question is related to the previous slide, actually. So I'm a little bit slow. Sure. Sorry about that. So conceptually, if a manager or firm has a perfect portfolio that, you know, per perfectly just made your firms perfectly insensitive to market risk, then like I've been, but then you're just adding up this exposure to, like individual businesses exported to market risk. So just about this, the first equation, do you, like, is it possible to consider the in, like interaction of different businesses? Okay, so if they have different businesses and their risks might offset, for example, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it, so. Yeah, in this right. situation, you just add up, um, is it? Yeah, so I guess one question about that is, is it additive? And that part, I can't, I'm not sure, right? We don't, we're just assuming it's additive and we go forward with that. Um, in terms of, can you have offsetting things going on in your business? So we, I think we have that happening a little bit in our estimation. So let, let me go to this here and then um, not completely though. So let me, let me sort of give you the part where I think we're doing what you're asking. And then let me agree with the part that we're not doing what you're asking about. So here, so then what we do is we turn to the variance, right? So if you have the variance of these risk factors, and the covariance of these risk factors, then that you can then easily combine those with the income statement line items to come up with the variance of expected um, future earnings. That's just like math, right? It's easy to do. Um, and I think it is in these covariances where we're picking up, um, you can have one business um, acting one way, another business, part of your business acting a different way, and so though the, the correlation between both those risk factors or yeah, the risk factors, how much those risk factors vary over time um, affects what you weight in terms of the income statement line items. So if, 
for example, they have um, one risk factor that offsets another risk factor, then this is going to be picked up here in, in our equation. That's not exactly what you asked. So um, if, if you have different like business models, for example, and their income statement items offset each other, we can't pick that up here, right? We're, we're just getting if the risk factors, the systematic factors offset each other. And um, to some extent, if they're exposed to different risk factors that offset each other, then we're in good shape. But in terms of if they have their, like their beta, for example, um, we can't separate, you know, net income, a component of net income here is the beta. We, if they have one beta that offsets another beta, um, we don't capture that. Okay, so, um, and that's where I think it would be ideal. The ideal situation would be if we had separate items, like if we had an income statement for um, product line A, an income statement for product line B, um, there, and things were separated by their risk levels, that would be the perfect situation, right? That would be really great. <laughs> um, but we don't have that. So does that sort of help? I mean, sort of we're getting what you want, sort of not. Yeah, so I mean, if, if that's what you want to do, I think one way to go is just use the segment level. I mean, you cannot get very disaggregated information for each individual segment, but one way to go is just to separately estimate for the business line or segment, I think. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. We could totally do that, right? Because then that would give you two different business lines that, that would give different exposures. Yeah, that probably is actually a great estimation approach. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ayung. Yeah, I think while you are addressing <laughs> Song Ying's question, I, I think potentially one thing you can do, and that it's also related to the matching uh, principle questions that Sudipta had before, is that if we are assuming uh, revenue cost by goods sold and net SGNA is purely just the matching principle, like there's a everybody just record cost and goods sold and SGNA as a percentage of the revenue, yeah. then if you collect these three line items into one item, uh, you should find identical results. The risk information will be identical. But if somehow accountants actually input some extra information, collect extra information, then uh, analyzing or having those three line items separately in your estimation model will actually yield incremental risk information. It's a very high level, but I think yeah. there's a room for you to actually aggregate some of the line item versus kind of like break it down into more detail, for example, at the segment level or business line item. Uh, yeah. And then yeah. to actually explore which line item or which cut potentially would reveal the more risks, systematic risk information. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So let me give you a little bit of what we did have done related to that. And then yeah. I agree we we could do more on this. The, the part that we have done is, um, well, I, I guess let me start with another problem and then answer that. So um, here we've got multiple things, right? So if revenue cost of goods sold, let's say, let's just do revenue and cost of goods sold. If those are, um, like you said, cost of goods sold is just a percent of revenue. Then we've got two things in here that are the same or nearly the same. And one of the problems that that creates is, well, this gamma one and gamma two, they're influenced by the fact that these two are highly correlated. So that creates another problem, right? So if we think of this as gamma and, and it's a cost of equity measure, well, cost of equity, should be positive, right? It should all, but the, when these are highly correlated, then it's really the sort of marginal effect on cost of equity rather than you know, an independent uh, cost of equity measure. So we do find that these gammas, when we estimate them, end up being over time highly correlated. And some of them are negative, right? The revenue one is negative, the cost of goods sold is positive. So it does suggest that these are sharing there is a large amount of sharing information with, with these line items. Um, but we what we did do is we repeated some of the tests, um, removing a few of these items and just using aggregated income instead, right? So we tried a few things to make that work. Um, 
And what we end up finding is separating it out works the best. Like it explains returns and, and explains volatility the most. So um, I think we have some evidence that says splitting them out is really valuable. That means they have other information um, together, but it does end up being there. You know, there this correlation is really important, right? So um, I don't know, that's sort of addressing what you're talking about too, but um, yeah. I agree, we should think about um, I think you should you should think about more that. positively, not just try to controlling that away, but like it's kind of like run the horse race to SDC. Potentially, we learn something from this exercise that what line items, uh, sure, yeah, or how combinations, right? And it's kind of related to the design issue earlier. Is that should we actually need more disaggregated or actually more aggregated income statement to actually reveal uh, more risk risk information? Here, the criteria is that which layout would give us yeah. cross-sectionally most risk information yeah 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 i agree there's more to uh, let, so let me um bring up another problem that is related to what you're asking about that is I, it, it turns out at least for us it's quite challenging to think about how do we do this like how do we do it correctly especially when you're thinking about like well we're we want to deal with cross-sectional data it, there's a lot of things to figure out and it's not that easy. Um, so a, another related problem to that is um, that, well, yeah, so the, it when we want to think about what they mean, right, this, so we come back here as this is like a cost of equity measure. Well, as soon as we split them up into pieces, Conceptually, we don't even know what gamma one is, right? Like when you, what does that mean? And that's super hard to figure out. <laughs> and so um, going down these em empirical methods of trying different things opens up the problem of we still don't know how to interpret those, right? Like we don't have a, like a uh, easily, like that's aggregate earnings, right? Like some of these other papers um, that do at, different versions of aggregate, aggregate earnings to measure sort of the systematic information. We don't have that, right? We're just saying this is a coefficient that should be a risk factor, but we don't even know what risk factor that is. So it's a little bit of a challenge here. And so if we start going down the path of doing even more, um, we we could end up with a better measure, but we could also end up with, we don't know how to interpret any of it. So, um, so let me talk about this interpretation and maybe that'll point out some of these issues. But um, yeah, thanks for all the comments. I think these, you know, a lot of things that we can work on that um, could be important here. Um, let me talk about the, the interpretation of a few ways of interpreting it. So these are the gammas. This is the, the mean of the gammas over, you know, the, the time, all of our sample here. And revenue is, right, all of the income items. So revenue, negative, um, profitability, these, these ones that are non-operating items, special purpose items, right? Those are measured in income terms, negative. So, and then all of the expense ones are positive. So how do you interpret that, right? Because if this is a, we, oh, and these are multiplied, so they're not that big, right? They're um, smaller than that, but it's, they're closer to a cost of equity measure, you know, in, in terms of expected returns. Um, but when you have a negative item, that a negative gamma, that says it's a negative cost of equity, that's weird, right? So it's just a relative to the others. Um, and then what does that mean when you get negative on all of these and positive on all of these? Well, we spend a lot of time in the paper trying to explain what we think is happening but it's difficult to do a, a sort of definitive interpretation of what these gammas are. So our interpretation is sort of related to some of um, Penman's stuff. Um, so, you know, he has this thing that says that um, when you, well, it's not, he's not the only, he, he has multiple papers, others have these too, but when you convert um, potential sales, right, like expected demand or something into cash, you, you just um, change the risk of your um, company because converting a, a receivable into cash, now you have a, an asset that is lower 
um, required return than if you had just receivables, right? Because you're you're changing your risk exposures. You have a low beta asset that you're putting in as cash. You're exchanging that for a high risk asset that's uncertain in the um, receivables. And the same thing when you have um, you convert human capital to actual cash, right? You're changing um, a higher risk um, asset for a low risk asset in terms of collecting cash. So our interpretation then of that reasoning is uh, income items that increase cash are changing, are shifting the risk exposure in, from the company into lower risk um, items. So collecting cash, lowering the risk of the company, spending cash, raising the risk of the company. Yeah, Sripta. But shouldn't you be talking about this at the portfolio of this? So you will collect some and you will write off some, but what really matters is the mix. And so long as you've estimated your risk correctly in your bad debt expense, uh, this should already have sort of flown through and everything. So I'm, unless there's some unexpected portions, you're not really changing your beta. You've already estimated that into your bad debt computations. Sure. So um, I, I think conceptually, I agree with you. It's the portfolio, everything together, right? That that the company does. I think we are capturing that. So here I'm talking about individual gammas, but when we're doing this, we're we're putting them all together. So at a firm level, how do they? How does all that risk and risk exposure combine into one piece? So. Um, marginally, as you do this, that increase, you know, like it's as you collect cash from your sales, you're reducing the risk of your company, but that's, that's only looking at that one piece by itself. When we try to capture this measure, it's put, put it all together because, um, cost of goods sold, you know, whatever you do with cost of goods sold could offset what you're doing with revenues, right? All of these can then combine together to the same thing. So, yeah. We're trying to do that conceptual um, or in, in our measure, and I agree with you, yeah. Okay, so then um, we'll skip this one here. Uh, then what we did is a few things to try and see if it if they are actually risk factors, this gamma, then you know each of these gammas, then it, they should be correlated with things that look like, you know, other things that we already know are risk factors, or at least we suspect are risk factors. And the main point is, yes, our gammas do correlate with other things that look like risk factors. So it's it's not anything conclusive, but it's trying to help you think maybe they're getting what they think they're getting. Okay. Um, we'll skip that. So then I think, let me just talk about a few, let me get to a few of the main results here. Um, so we, these, so we, we combine everything, measure this sigma, and then it's correlated with other things that look like um, volatility and expected returns. Um, what we end up finding, so then, then we go into the test and say, if it works, right? If we did all of this right, then hopefully this shows up as a something that looks like systematic risk. So we sort gamma, I mean, we sort sigma uh, into portfolios, look at the returns, and we do a bunch of tests, but. Um, this is sort of one of the main things here. And what we find is sorting based on sigma also sorts based on future expected returns. So higher sigma has higher future expected returns. And that's um, incremental to these other, you know, the Fama French sort of factors as well. Um, then we go in to try and say, well, uh, what is it that Sigma is capturing and does it matter? And um, does it matter relative to other measures that we might think about? So this is again, the return regression Sigma across all of them. And we tried some of the things that these other papers looking at total volatility did. So we have the time series volatility here. Once you control for other things, those don't predict returns at all. The expected uncertainty from um, a couple of these other papers what they found is that expected uncertainty is negatively correlated with future returns. Um, and you know, we find the same thing. Well, 
this was what we set out to try and figure out, right? Is, is the systematic volatility or expected volatility in earnings um, look like this? And no, it doesn't, right? Systematic or the uncertainty, total uncertainty using these two different measures negatively correlated with returns. Um, it's sort of a joint test if we're getting what we think we're getting, but um, if we are getting the systematic risk, it worked the way we thought it should and it's positively correlated with um, returns. Then a, a couple of, oh, sorry, uh, two more things. So um, if we also put in these other time series measures of systematic risk, so um, just putting in the income measures, those don't affect the sigma, but then there are these other betas that people have used. So these are based on aggregate earnings uh, information. This is the time series of uh, earnings beta. Those predict returns, but not they're not the same thing as what we're picking up as well. And um, then the next thing we try to do is say, is it is ours useful, right? Because you, you know now if you're going to say, well, we could just go use earnings beta, or we could use these other things, right, that are alternatives to what we're using. Um, well, in some cases you can't. So what ends up happening is where there is there is analyst coverage, it works. Where there is not analyst coverage, it also works. So um, we can't in places where you can't use um, the earnings beta from analyst forecast, then ours works just fine. Um, Another part is, well, what if you don't have any time series to be able to estimate a time series approach? Ours works actually best in those circumstances and okay in the other circumstances. Um, and then this is the standard test you got to use. And then another one that we, the final couple things that I wanted to show is we tried to try and ask when will so our measure, what it does is capture a lot of features about systematic risk, right? So lots of different gammas, lots of different parts of the income statement. So when is it that our measure is going to matter a lot, you know, incremental to other things, right? Because if you just put in income, for example, that's part of our measure. So um, the, the incremental information that we think we're providing is about really um, wide um, risk exposure exposures to lots of different risks and one because our measure updates every income statement right we can just get a new income statement comes out we can um, have a totally different risk uh, measure than you had the last year or, or the last time um, so if that's the case then our measure should be incrementally really valuable where we think um, systematic risk exposure is changing a lot or um, or when um, the systematic risk that they're exposed to has lots of fact, uh, you know, um, types of risk exposure. So we did two things to deal with that or to try and test that. One was, and this is based on some prior research, but also our intuition is that when you are a low performing company, uh, you are exposed, you have to change your risk exposures because you're not doing so well, change what you're exposed to, you can improve, uh, you know, your performance. So low performance, we think, would be associated with times where there's lots of changes in risk exposure. And um, in low-performing companies is where our measure is most informative about um, future returns relative to the um, higher-performing companies. And then um, we did the same thing. This is sort of related to Sadipta's comment earlier, where we say um, in a recession, we think suddenly there are lots of risk exposures a systematic risk going on. And it turns out when we are in recessions, our measure works really well. Um, doesn't mean our measure, uh, it, it's really highly, highly correlated with returns. Um, if, you know, if we concede Sadipta's point about, well, maybe we're not capturing and there's something spurious in our measure, well, then that could also be this, you know, what's going on. But it seems to be working at least when, when that occurs. So, um, yeah, and then the rest is just extra stuff. So let me summarize with um, what I think the most important thing we're finding here is um, we've got a measure of the cross section of income statement items. And that tells us about a firm systematic risk exposure. And I don't think as a profession, we, we currently think about 
income statement items or balance sheet items as risk exposures, right? We think about them as cash flow information or we aggregate them to think about um, like a, a factor that is from aggregate earnings. But the income statement items themselves tell us about how exposed the firm is to, risk, to systematic risk. And I think that's the conceptual uh, innovation. And it's there are a few papers related to that, but I think that's the part that I think is most interesting. And we've worked on a way to, to take the cross-section of information of, of, of income statement items to come up with a what is kind of a time series concept of what is systematic risk exposure, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah, um, I think I have like one last question. Is that it seems like the gamma is capturing this mean reversion process. It's kind of like today's level, how closely that level relates to futures changes, right? And then given that your result is that young age firm, firms with only live for one year or recessionary years that you found stronger results, I wonder you can also kind of like test whether your gamma can predict bankruptcy or delisting. So it's kind of related to Sudipta's earlier point, it's kind of more tail event. It seems that those tail extreme negative or left tail events actually work in favor of your measure because you seem to capture those young firms or uh, high risk periods better than other period. And that's probably the advantage of using a cross-sectional test because you are able to include all those uh, short-lived firms, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying, let me start, you had a lot to say there. So let me let me just go on to one of those pieces. So here, um, you're saying that gammas could reflect mean reversion. So when we have like this regression here, changes in income on income statement items, yeah. and you yeah. see, for example, high higher revenue is associated with lower future changes in returns, I mean, in, in earnings. If you were to say, I want to measure mean reversion, this is almost precisely the thing that you would want to use, right? So, um, right, so for example, the in our, where's my regression one? This one. So if we if we ran this regression and you see negative here, or even better, just put in earnings, for example, aggregated, and you see a negative value, you would say, oh, that's, look, we have mean reversion in earnings is sort of what you would conclude from that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the I our reasoning here is that um, mean reversion could, now I agree with you that that could be what part of what's happening. Um, we think, though, if the mean reversion is related to systematic risk, um, then we should be able to, like, that is one way that a firm is exposed to risk is um, when something happens, do their earnings revert? And so that is a feature of systematic risk is what we're sort of are, are thinking about. Um, the in terms of whether that, um, if it's just mean reversion, I think that's a good question, right? Like if, if you could come up with some measure, for example, that looks at earnings and returns during a recession, for example, would if you could isolate mean reversion and just capture that, would could that be everything that's driving our results? It's I mean, I, I just, I mean, we have to acknowledge that could be the case, right? I think, unless Juan, did we, I think we talked about this a bunch. Did you, did you come up with that? I mean, did we talk about anything else? I think that's it. I, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's possible. I uh, don't have a better answer than that, I think. Sorry, interruption, but you have one minute left. Oh, well, I'm good. So, um, I mean, I hope you found it interesting. Like, I think this is, uh, I think, I think we have some innovations in, in the concept and, and the measure. Um, yeah, Sudipta. So um, betas are also asymmetric and tend to be higher during recessions. Yeah. yeah. So that's just sort of following up on Ayun's comment. So uh, yep. it's yep. not just in your accounting measure, it's also in your return measure if you're going to sort of focus on recessions. Sure, yeah, for sure, right. 
and I think all of these are lots of the comments here are um, when you're trying to do something that you're developing this measure and then trying to see what happens. There's for sure we have not got everything right in the measure, right? I, but I I think at least we're making the right the steps in that direction. Whether whether all of it is believable is yeah that's a that's a hard thing. So. Thanks for all your comments. I, I, I think the, these are great things to keep thinking about and trying to see if we can address. Um, I appreciate that. And, um, and if, if some of you read it, sorry about the long, painful thing. So, um, all right, so I'll be stick, I'll stick around I'd like in the past if anyone wants to talk or ask or you know make comments or stuff, happy to do that. But um, otherwise, thank you. <laughs>